It's a great pleasure to be back again this morning and uh, I think I recognise some of the faces here today so I obviously didn't put everybody off last night. Those of you here last night will remember that we spoke about um, the background to John Owen in terms of Reformation theology and what was going on in the 16th and 17th century, particularly in England and the uh, great social traumas that took place during that time related to religion and related to society and how this had uh, informed and shaped the way Owen thought about the world. Then we went on to think more broadly about how Reformed theology and particularly the Reformed theology of John Owen related to what had gone before it and I made the point that we must get beyond the idea that the Reformation makes everything new. The Reformation does change one or two crucial things, particularly on matters of justification and issues of authority and the nature of the church. But on the whole, um, Reformed theology was very concerned to connect itself to the past, partly because in the 17th century you didn't want to come up with a new idea if you could possibly help it, because new ideas, generally speaking, were considered wrong ideas and got you into trouble. And then finally, towards the end last night, I spoke about the various groups that Owen found himself having to engage in controversy with. I mentioned the Roman Catholic Church, which is, I suppose, the obvious one in many ways, but also the rise of a a theological movement called Arminianism. And closely related to Arminianism, uh, a group called the Socinians, who started off as followers of these Italian father and uncle, Lilio and Fausto Sozzini, and went on to develop a much more radical form of theology that denied the Trinity, denied the substitutionary nature of the atonement, uh, denied the existence of original sin and of human depravity. And it's worth perhaps just mentioning at this point that the Socinians are uh, the, modern, the, the antecedents of modern day Unitarianism. In fact, if you look back to the early 20th century, the 19th century, to see who was reprinting classic Socinian works, on the whole it was the Unitarians. The Unitarians self-consciously looked back to the Socinians as their forebears. There are some variations within Socinianism. Not all Socinians were Unitarian. Some believed uh, that the Holy Spirit too was God and had divine personality and essence. But they were basically agreed on denying the true and full deity of the Son. That was the thing that was the hallmark of the Socinians. And I want to come down today then to look in more detail at how Owen responded to these groups, how his theology develops uh, in relation to these groups. And it's going to involve talking about one or two relatively rarefied theological concepts, but I will try to, to make what I say as clear as I possibly can. The Arminian doctrine of God in the 16th and 17th century is built around a thing called middle knowledge. Get the term, middle knowledge. Well, what is middle knowledge? In the Middle Ages, medieval theologians divided the knowledge of God. They said, you know, God has, for the sake of argument, two kinds of knowledge. In fact, God only has one kind of knowledge, but we're finite humans. In order to make God more comprehensible, we make what we call formal distinctions in God. We make divisions in God that don't really exist in him in quite that way, in him himself, but they're to allow us to understand him more clearly. And medieval theologians made an important distinction between what they called uh, God's knowledge of all things and God's knowledge of what is actually going to happen. Uh, God's knowledge of all things essentially is his knowledge of himself. Because God is infinite and knows all things, God can know even those things that he could have created but didn't, if we can put it that way. God didn't have to create this world. He didn't have to create this world this way. He could have knowledge of other worlds, where let's say he'd created trees that were, I don't know, purple, for example. Take a trivial example. He could have created a world where I never existed. There's no necessity that God had to create this world. And theologians talked about God's knowledge of all things, God's knowledge of all possibilities, if you like, that is greater 
than the world that he actually did create. There's also his knowledge of things that actually happen. We call this knowledge of vision in the Middle Ages and that's his knowledge of the things that he's decided to do. The importance in the distinction is that it allows us to understand this world as stable and reliable because God has committed himself to creating this world without yet reducing God to the level of this world. I have knowledge of it. I know what a unicorn looks like. A unicorn is like a horse with a horn sticking out of his forehead. Unicorns, as far as I know, have never existed. But if I know what a unicorn is, then one presumes that God knows what a unicorn is. God has decided not to create a unicorn, but that's part of his knowledge of all possibles, if you like. According to his knowledge of vision, there are no unicorns. So it's a complicated point, but what it's essentially saying is God knows everything. Everything that God knows is greater than that which he's created. And out of that great vast ocean of possibilities, infinite possibilities, he's decided to do a certain number of things. Create this world, create these people, set the world up in this way. Middle knowledge is an idea that there is a form of knowledge in God between his knowledge of all possibles and his knowledge of what is actual. It was invented by, well it wasn't invented, but it was developed and uh, made more sophisticated by a group of Roman Catholic theologians in the later part of the 16th century. And they said, there is a kind of knowledge in God where he knows the possible worlds that he could have created but didn't create. Take me as an example. God knows that on a certain time, on a certain day, I trusted in Christ and I was united in Christ, with Christ by faith. That's this world. God knows that world. But these theologians said he also knows possible worlds where, under the same set of conditions, I didn't do that. Placed in a certain position at a certain time, hearing the preaching of the gospel, God knows that in this world where all these things happen, I will be converted, and in that world I will not. What God decides to do is, well, I'd like Truman to be one of my elect. And therefore, I choose to realise and create the world where I know that Truman will express faith in Jesus Christ at this point in time and not the alternative worlds. I might just say at this point, is there anyone with a question about that? Everyone's with me so far? Well, there are various things that that view depends upon. First of all, it depends upon the fact that human beings are free to choose. The view of middle knowledge depends upon the fact that human beings are ultimately free to choose for themselves because at the end of the day, the various possible worlds God can think of, only if human beings are free to choose, will they choose without God's intervention. Secondly, it depends upon God being able to conceive of a world where he is not the direct, ultimate cause for all that goes on. We'll return to that in a few minutes' time. Essentially what the idea does, if you like, it tries to solve the old problem between free will and determinism, between God's sovereignty and human freedom. Human beings in the world that God has chosen to create act freely but God gets the result he wants because he chooses to realise the world where freely acting human beings will give him the result he wants and not another result. And this idea proves very attractive to the Arminians. And Jacob Arminius builds this into his system and then it becomes current, common currency throughout the Arminian world, if you like. That the problem of divine sovereignty and human freedom has been solved by the fact that God has knowledge of an infinite number of worlds where human beings act freely and he chooses to realise that one world where all of the results that he would like to see happen actually happen. So the result is assured because God is not going to create any other world but the result is also the act of human freedom because God knows that human beings will freely act to give him the result he wants. It's picked up by the Arminians and developed by them in a very elaborate fashion. For the Socinians, however, the Socinians see the problem. There is a problem in this view and the problem is that it doesn't really solve the relationship between 
free will and determinism. If you think about it this way, if God has decided to create a world where I, he knows that I will freely choose to become a Christian on a certain day at a certain time in a certain place, and he's decided not to allow the world to be set up in any other way than will guarantee him that result, where I act freely and choose Christ in that place, that time, on that occasion, am I free at that point in time, in that place, on that occasion, to act differently? The answer is no. There is, if you like, a logical problem there. And the Sicinians pick up on this. And guess what they do? The Sicinians argue that the problem with the Arminian view is God knows the future. Now, I've given you some pretty elaborate stuff, I suppose, so far today and it's kind of confusing on one level, I suppose. But it becomes very contemporary in its application at this particular point in time. The problem the Sicinians point out is that if God knows the future in any shape or form whatsoever, then that future must be determined. If God knows here and now on this day that there will be a sea battle at noon tomorrow, there will be a sea battle at noon tomorrow. It is determined now what will happen at noon tomorrow. And if God knows the proposition there will be a sea battle at noon tomorrow and he knows that that proposition is false, that there will not be a sea battle at noon tomorrow, then there cannot be a sea battle at noon tomorrow. So Socinianism takes up the Arminian idea of middle knowledge and exposes its logical flaws and abandons God's knowledge of the future. That's an important point to grasp in contemporary evangelical thinking because there is a movement called the openness of God. It's perhaps not quite as trendy today as it was two or three years ago. But open theists such as Clark Pinnock argue that God has a very, very limited knowledge of the future. Because if God has any knowledge of the future at all, then the future is determined and closed in some sense. And it's often said, and Clark Pinnock himself presents this as a major critique of Reformed theology. The views of Clark Pinnock, the views of the Socinians, are ultimately not so much a critique of Reformed theology as they are of Arminian theology. The problems that open theism points to, the problems that Socinianism points to, are not problems in Reformed theology because, to put it in the most negative way possible, we've already conceded the point that human beings' freedom is radically limited in holding the views we do. We've already surrendered that point, so it's not a problem to us anymore. It is only a problem if you want to argue that human beings are radically free, but God also knows what the future looks like. So, Socinianism and open theism are what one might call crises in Arminianism, not in Reformed theology. How does Owen respond to this? Well, Owen, typical of the Reformed Orthodox, offers a two-pronged attack, well, three-pronged attack against Socinianism and Arminianism. First of all, he refers to all of the passages in Scripture that speak very, very clearly about God having knowledge of the future. Socinianism, he says, falls by its own standard of going to Scripture. That there are many, many passages in Scripture that speak of God having control of knowing that evil will be ultimately subverted, of having a very clear view of what the future is like. In fact, at the end of John Owen's book on Socinianism, um, there is a very funny Socinian catechism that Owen puts together, drawn, as he says, from the Socinian writings. And it's it's a bit cheap shotty, I guess, but it's quite amusing. He says, um, starts off by saying, uh, what is God? And the answer is, God is a body. The next question is, where is God? He is in heaven. The next question is, what does God do there? he sits there wondering what might happen tomorrow. Uh, And the next question is, of what pastoral use is that? And Owen says, I don't know, you go and figure it out. Uh, So, Owen's first uh, uh, prong of attack is to focus on the biblical teaching about God knowing the future. Second line of attack is to point again to the logical flaw that is in middle knowledge, that if God knows the truth of future propositions, we can say this logically, then those future propositions have to be realised, have to come true. If God knows the truth about the sea battle at noon tomorrow, 
then here and now it's determined what's going to happen tomorrow. But the third point that Owen makes, and this is interesting because it, 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 it reminds us that we always need to nuance our doctrine of God when we come to think about omnipotence and things like that. Owen and his colleagues argue that it is impossible, it is impossible for God to imagine a world where he is not the determining cause of all that goes on. Arminianism is saying that God can think of all these possible worlds where human beings are free agents and can act independent of God, in a way, to make choices. Owen says it's actually impossible for God to conceive of a world like that. In other words, he's saying God cannot conceive of a world, if you like, where he is not God. Because it is of the nature of God to be creator over his creation. It is of the nature of God to be the one who providentially guides everything. That is complicated. It leads to serious, uh, what we call theodicy issues over the nature of evil and how evil connects to God. But in some deep and mysterious way, nothing happens in the realm of creation that isn't ultimately connected to God's will in some way. And what Owen says is that middle knowledge, this idea that God can imagine a world where he is not God, where he is not guiding everything that happens towards a conclusion that he has determined, that would require God to conceive a world where he's not God. And God cannot do that any more than God can conceive of a triangle with four sides. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. But there are some things he can't do. And one of them is conceived of a triangle with four sides. And one of them is conceived of a world which is created where he is not the creator God. It makes no sense for God to think of that. And the implication of that is, of course, that we cannot conceive of that either. I mean, that's another story that takes it off in an entirely different epistemological direction. But at the end of the day, God cannot deny himself, even hypothetically, in the way he thinks about the world. And the final line of attack, of course, is the nature of sin itself. For Owen, human beings are enclosed under sin. It doesn't matter how many worlds God conceives of. In every single world that he conceives of, he has to conceive, if Adam has fallen, of men and women as fallen human beings and as therefore incapable of turning to him under their own power. He can conceive of a million worlds, he can conceive of a billion worlds, he can conceive of an infinite number of worlds with fallen human beings in it. And in every single one of those worlds, human beings will be morally incapable of turning to God without the operative intervention of God's grace, turning them around and turning them to God in and of his own power. So the first thing I wanted to say about Owen's doctrine of God today is it's shaped by his conflict with Socinianism and Arminianism. And it leads him to uh, refine in many ways what he's inherited from the Reformers. The Reformers were not faced with these problems. When you read John Owen on the doctrine of God, he's using language, technical language and distinctions that you do not find in the Reformers. In fact, when John, Owen, when John Calvin tries to use these distinctions, more often than not he gets them wrong. He was not well trained in medieval theology. He makes some very stupid comments about medieval theology in his time, uh, including one, such ones where he will deny a particular distinction, which he says is nonsense, and then will offer his own version of it, which is exactly the same as the medieval one, just using different language. When you come to the 17th century, John Owen draws deeply upon what we talked about last night, those anti-Pelagian medieval trajectories of theology that allow him to address very, very fine distinctions in the doctrine of God that are being elaborated and pushed by the opponents of orthodoxy. And you might say, well, middle knowledge, what's all the fuss about? The fuss is about this. It creates an incoherent doctrine of God. Middle knowledge inevitably leads to Socinianism. And Socinianism leaves you with a God for whom the future is open. And just on a purely practical level, the gains that the open theists and the Socinians make in being able to excuse God from sin and evil are very, very quickly swept away 
in the losses of God not knowing and being in control of the future. It may be an immediate fix to be able to say to the parent whose child is dying of cancer, well, this has nothing to do with God. It may be a very, very quick fix to say that. But then if it's nothing to do with God and is out of God's control, what long-term comfort can be brought into that situation? You know, and how many of us have not been faced at some point in a situation in our lives where we've been desperate to be able to say to somebody, God has nothing to do with this. For a short-term excuse, if you like, which would ultimately lead to long-term disaster. So remember, these are fine distinctions, but they have very immediate practical problems. As it says in Owen's Sicinian Catechism, what practical use is it that God is a body, sits in heaven and wonders about tomorrow? I don't know. You figure it out is Owen's answer to that one. So then, the first thing about Owen's uh, uh, doctrine of God is how it is shaped by the conflict with Arminianism and Socinianism. And for all of the rarefied distinctions, it's a very practical pastoral problem at the end of the day. It comes down to what Owen is able to say to people in the pastoral context about God's control of evil and of bad things that are happening. Second dimension of Owen's uh, doctrine of God that I want to talk about this morning is his understanding of divine righteousness. It lies at the heart of the Socinian view of God that there is no need for atonement. There is no need for atonement. And that rests upon two things. First of all, it it rests on a very light view of human sin. And secondly, it rests upon a very high view, if you like, of God's freedom to contradict himself, essentially. For Owen, for God to forgive sin, there must be atonement. Once God has decided that human beings are to be forgiven for their sin, he has to send his son to become incarnate and to die on the cross. And that's interesting because it actually sets Owen at odds with Calvin. It puts Owen at odds with people like Samuel Rutherford and William Twiss. The Reformed faith is not united on the necessity of atonement, interestingly enough. For John Calvin, for Samuel Rutherford, for William Twiss, Christ becomes incarnate because God has decided that that is the way to bring about salvation. God could, if he wished, have forgiven sin by a mere act of his will. God could, if he wished, have forgiven sin by becoming incarnate in a stone. These men have a high view of the freedom of God, And as far as they're concerned, atonement could have been achieved by a mere act of God's will. But God decided to do it in this particular way. For Owen, that is not acceptable, and it's not acceptable again because of what he fears the Socinians are doing. Owen's view is that as soon as you make the atonement something that didn't necessarily have to happen in order to bring about forgiveness, you make the atonement unnecessary and you are halfway towards the Socinian view of atonement that says Christ was never God, never incarnate in the first place. I stress the point that the Reformed are divided over this because there's a sense in which this is not a confessional issue. You don't have to agree with Owen on this one to be confessional, but I think one needs to see the problems which he's highlighting. Interestingly enough, Owen changes his own view on this. In 1647, he says... um, those who say that Christ had to become incarnate in order to bring about salvation, he said, that's an Arminian error. He dismisses it as an Arminian error. Five years later, in 1652, he's saying, those who tell you that Christ didn't have to become incarnate, they're walking a dangerous line towards Socinianism. And he never actually says, oh, by the way, I've changed my mind on this. I think he just tries to get away with it by kind of sleight of hand. If he hammers it hard enough later on, people for- will forget what he says in the death of death. But it's very clearly there when you look at it. How does Owen combat the Socinian error at this point? Well, what's very interesting about this is he goes to some Roman Catholic theologians for some good ideas as he sees it. The whole question is, We talked last night about ectypal theology and archetypal theology. The whole question for Owen is how God's actions in history connect to what he is in himself. 
how is it that if God pours out his wrath upon sin, what does that tell us about God? Does it tell us that God has simply decided to do that? Or does it tell us that there's something in God that requires him to do that? If you like, we're trying to connect God's actions in the world with what God is like in himself. An awful lot of Owen's theology is absorbed with trying to work out what we might say, how the economy of salvation, how the things that go on in creation and redemption, how they connect to God as he is in himself. And for people like Samuel Rutherford, the answer is very simple. God pours out his wrath on sin because he's decided so to do. We cannot speculate about what God is like in himself. We can simply say that God has decided (coughs) to act in this particular way. For Owen, however... That is not adequate for combating the Socinian error. For Owen, there has to be some connection between the way God acts and the way he actually is in himself. <coughs> and Owen, interesting enough, goes to a man called Francisco Suarez, the writings of a man called Suarez. Suarez is a Roman Catholic Jesuit theologian. And it's a, a classic test case in somebody going to somebody that one might have thought was an enemy in order to get a very good argument. And Suarez says that when we use language about God, when we talk about God's righteousness, when we talk about his wrath and his justice, we're essentially talking about his actions towards creation. When we say that God is just, we're saying that he acts justly in creation. And in order to know what justice is like, we look at how God acts. He's faithful to his covenant. He punishes sin. The ground opens up and swallows people when they cross him. When somebody stretches out their hand and inappropriately touches the ark of God, they're struck dead. All of these actions speak to us about what God's justice looks like. But Suarez makes uh, a further point and says, when God exhibits a consistent pattern of action repeatedly, then it is legitimate and okay for us to say that reflects something about how God is in himself. So when God consistently punishes sin throughout history, it is a reasonable assumption to assume that there is something in God that, dare one say it from a human perspective, requires him to act that way. Not that there is some standard above God to which God is answerable, but there is some natural element of his own being that requires him to be that way. If you like, it's like, I mean, why am I only in one place at one time? Uh, One could say, well, it's not because there is some great law up there that I have to look up to and observe and think to myself, must remember to be in one place at one time. It is part of the essence of me as a body, an embodied person, that I can only be in one place at one time. And the point Suarez is making is that if God acts in this way consistently over a long period of time, then it's a reasonable assumption to assume that there is something in God's being that requires him to be that kind of God. And Owen picks up on this and says, the issue with the Sassinians <coughs> is that they've really, in some ways, they've evacuated God of all content whatsoever. They make his attributes merely his actions. You can't tell anything about God from the way he acts because... There is no necessary connection between the way God acts and who he is in himself. There's no connection whatsoever. Owen, using Suarez, says that one must bear in mind that if God demonstrates himself to be angry and wrathful against sin, that is because there's something in his being, infinite and mysterious and archetypal though it may be and incapable for us to fully grasp other than it's revealed, There's something in his being that requires him to act this way. So given the reality of human sin, it is necessary that he send his son to die on the cross because only the sacrifice of the perfect God-man, finite man and infinite God, the person of the mediator, only that sacrifice will meet the requirements of God's own being for the forgiveness of sin. Nothing else will do it. So the Socinian scheme and even the scheme of Twiss and Rutherford falls apart because it doesn't anchor the incarnation, one might say, in the very being of God. For Owen, the incarnation, the necessity for incarnation in the light of sin is anchored in the very being of God. It must be this way. 
And this is where, incidentally, somebody asked me last night, how does Owen counter the Socinian idea that if uh, sin has been punished in Christ, there can be no forgiveness? The grace and forgiveness comes in for Owen at the point where God decides to send his son. God doesn't have to do that. God is committed by his being to punishing sin. He is not committed to sending his son to be a sacrifice for sin. So the gracious action of God, if you like, is rooted in the decision for sending the son. And that's where grace and forgiveness enters the equation. (coughs) It's very, very interesting because uh, it leads to... uh, I mean, Samuel Rutherford, for example, says... uh, counter to Owen's argument is wherever you look across the world he says whichever tribe or people you go to they all have an understanding that God is angry with them and needs to be placated and remember the 17th century is also an era where the world is becoming much bigger North America has been discovered I remember I teach a reformation at Westminster in the first year Um, at the end of the, the students have a chance to sort of get their own back on the lecturer by filling out these forms at the end of the course about whether it was worthwhile and that kind of thing. And um, I always do mine before I do the exam so they know that I get the last laugh. Um, Even though these things are anonymous, I do say to them, they might just happen to be lying on my desk as I check the handwriting and compare them with the examination scripts to see who said what. Uh, Somebody said to me uh, in one of these things that there hadn't been enough about America in the course. Heartbreaking to Americans to know, I know, but... In the 16th and 17th century, America had only just been discovered and was not that important at the time. The importance of America lay in that, well, it was a place that provided goods for Europe and created horrible inflationary problems within the various economies of Europe. Uh, that's, where, that's where its significance lay then. But the world is getting much bigger. And Owen looks around the world and he says to Rutherford, wherever you go in the world, people understand that God is angry with them and needs to be placated. And Rutherford's response is very interesting. He said, that's because at some point in the past, all of these tribes and nations had contact with the Jews and read the Old Testament scriptures. Owen's point is, there is something structural in humanity that knows God, whoever God is out there, needs to be placated. Rutherford's point is, there's nothing structural in humanity pointing that way at all. They got this idea because at some point in the past they read about it in the five books of Moses very interesting sort of debate and connects in some ways with uh, discussions that go on in study of religion today. But then, (coughs) so then, the importance of the atonement for Owen is anchored absolutely in the being of God. Why does God need to make atonement? Because human beings have sinned. How is that sin to be conceived of. How much longer have I got in this uh, lecture, Charles? 15 minutes. minutes. Okay, we'll move on to the the next section then. Another strand to Owen's understanding of uh, what is going on in creation, redemption, salvation, is the covenant of works. What is it that human beings have done that have so upset God that requires him to make atonement in this way? Well, for Owen, as for many of the Reformed, he understands Adam as a highly significant figure in this particular play. Where does he get that from? Well, in the 17th century, the importance of Adam was not so much rooted in Genesis 1 to 3 as it was in Romans 5. Covenant of works, which is the Reformed uh, term for the relationship between Adam and God, exegetically in the 17th century, is rooted far more in the Reformed understanding of Romans 5 than it is in Genesis 1-3. to Certainly Genesis 1-3 to is very, very significant. It provides a basis for understanding the historical Adam, for understanding the nature of what goes on in the garden. But the key thing when it comes to understanding Adam for the Reformed is his parallel with the Lord Jesus Christ. And underlying that is the idea that the end of the day, For Owen and for other Reformed, God only deals with the human race on the basis, really, of two people. Adam and Christ. And in order to understand the work of Christ, one must first understand the work of Adam. So what is this covenant of works that 
defines in many ways the nature of sin and defines the problem that Christ is sent to sort out. Well, the idea is this, that in the Garden of Eden, God condescended and entered into a relationship with Adam that said to Adam that if he obeyed certain rules, he would be immensely rewarded beyond his wildest dreams. And I'm going to say to you this morning, we're going to talk more about this in the next lecture, I'm going to say to you, unless you have a careful understanding of the covenant of works or something approximating it, you don't have to use the term. The term's not there in scripture. But unless you have the concept of the covenant of works with Adam, you can really have no understanding of what Christ has done for you. For Owen, if you don't have a covenant of works, then you can believe that Jesus Christ was God and came and lived and died and rose again on the third day and ascended to be at the right hand of his Father. And that's a really lovely story. And it may indeed have happened that way. But it's of no saving significance whatsoever. You need to understand the relationship between Adam and Christ in order to understand what Christ did. You need to understand what Adam did wrong in order to understand what Christ does on your behalf. Well, there are a couple of things to uh, mention in passing when we talk about the covenant of works. First of all, the term doesn't occur in Scripture. That's not a particularly worrying problem for me because a lot of terms we routinely use in Christian orthodoxy don't occur in Scripture. Scriptural sufficiency was never meant as a doctrine to teach that you only need to use the Greek and the Hebrew words that occur in Scripture. Covenant of works is a concept drawn from, collated from, Scripture as a whole. You can call it the Adamic administration if you want. I think that that particular uh, modification made by John Murray at Westminster is an unnecessary one. Covenant of works, I think, uh, covers the matter very, very nicely. What is the covenant of works? Well, the idea is that Adam is created as a representative head of the human race. When Adam acts, he acts as a public person. Think of the President of the United States. When the President of the United States goes to war against Iraq, let's say, he doesn't need every member of every citizen of the United States to personally declare war against Iraq. He has the representative power to do that. And when the president declares war against Iraq, frankly, it doesn't, care, it doesn't matter what your own personal opinions about that war are. You as an American citizen, and I suppose because Tony Blair's done a similar thing in Britain, myself as a British citizen, we are in a status of being at war with that country because our representative head has acted in a certain way. So the first thing about the covenant of the works for Owen is that Adam is a representative head of the human race. Second thing has to do with Adam's works. How is it that a human being could work in a way that gains such great reward from God? The bottom line is, he can't. Even a perfect Adam can only do finite works at the end of the day. Where does the value of those works come from? The value of those works comes from the condescension of God in setting up a covenant arrangement. I'll go to my pocket, I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. I've got a $20 bill in my pocket. What's it worth? It's worth $20, self-evident. So if I go and uh, put this under a tap and mulch it down and extract it into ink and paper, it's still worth $20, right? No. It's actually a worthless piece of paper. Intrinsically, it's a worthless piece of paper. It just happens to have a particular... You know, it's got... Is it Jefferson or Hamilton? It's Hamilton. He was shot by Aaron Burr, is that right? Yeah. It's, it's Alexander Hamilton. It's <laughs> Aaron Burr, of course, is Jonathan Edwards' grandson. That's an interesting sort of reformed connection there. It's Alexander Hamilton, who was a victim of one of Jonathan Edwards' answer, uh, descendants, is on there. It's a worthless piece of paper, but with this ink and this arrangement of letters, and I suppose there's probably a watermark on it and things like this, franking, it's worth $20. Why is it worth $20? Because there is, if you like... An arrangement between, I don't know whether it's the Central Reserve or whoever, whoever sort of anchors the currency in America, there is basically a covenantal relationship between those who hold that piece of paper and the overall economic system that says, if I walk into a shop and hand over $20, I get $20 worth of goods. 
the intrinsic value of the paper is neither here nor there. It's the covenant arrangement that sets it up. When I go in and hand over $20 and the person sells me something that's worth $5, am I legally entitled to $15 change? Absolutely. There is a strict relationship that holds within this, what one might call, arbitrarily established relationship. Once the system has been set up, arbitra- you know, the, the system that needn't be set up, once it's been set up to say that that piece of paper is worth $20, I then have strict legal entitlements within that arrangement. But I have to be within the terms of that arrangement to demand my strict entitlement. And Owen understands the relationship between Adam and God as being very much like that. God has said to Adam, you will do certain things and you will not do certain things. And your reward will be, you will not die. Do Adam's works merit the reward? Not strictly speaking, no. Not in an absolute sense. He's a finite creature and God could say, well, you've worked for 20 years, very hard, thank you very much, bye-bye, go back into oblivion. But God has condescended and set up a relationship. And once that relationship is set up, it then operates on a fairly strict basis. There is what theologians would say, there is no strict merit in an absolute sense because Adam's works only merit, they only earn things within the context of this relationship that's been set up. Once the relationship has been set up though, we can use the term, if you like, merit at that point. There is a meritorious dimension to Adam's works which is defined and determined by the covenantal relationship that's been set up. So when Adam does what he's supposed to do, he gets a reward beyond the intrinsic value of what he's done. I go into a shop and hand over a worthless piece of paper with Alexander Hamilton's face on it, I get $20 worth of goods, real goods. Adam works in the terms of the covenant of works and he gets a reward out of all proportion. Is it an unjust reward? No. Because he's earned it by the terms of the covenant which has been set up. Is it a reward of grace? Well, one has to be very careful about using the language of grace here. One might want to say that if you're thinking of grace in terms of God's condescension in setting up the covenant in the first place, then perhaps one can use the word. I think on the whole it's well worth avoiding the language of grace because it has redemptive connotations and redemption does not apply before sin. You can't be redeemed from something when you haven't fallen into debt over it. But it's a condescending relationship. But having been set up, it operates along pretty strict lines. And this, of course, we'll come to this in just uh, well, we'll come to this in the next lecture. This, of course, will determine the value of Christ's work. Why is it that Christ is able to earn a reward for us? Is it simply because he's Christ? Well, it may sound blasphemous to say it, but I think it is correct to say no. The fact that he's a God-man, that's great. But at the end of the day, that's not enough to make him a saviour. He has to be appointed as the second Adam. He has to tread the path that Adam trod. And he has to do it successfully in order for him to be the representative head of the human race. And we'll come to that in the second part of the class today. I've got a couple of minutes. I'll take any questions because I'm aware, certainly at the start of the class, if for the first thing on a Saturday morning, I kind of zapped you with some pretty tedious and abstruse stuff. So if anybody wants any points of clarification uh, made, please stick up your hands and, and ask. Don't ask kind of combative questions at this point. You can ask those later. But if there are points of clarification you want to, to ask, uh, please feel free to do so and I'll try to explain myself more thoroughly. The knowledge of all things, well, in, strictly speaking, the reform will say there is no distinction. Because what's being done here under, under the guise of smuggling in a third, uh, uh, of, of simply saying there's another distinction in knowledge that needs to be made, what's actually being done is a whole different doctrine of God is being smuggled in at this point. You're smuggling in this category of knowledge that God can have of worlds where he is not God. God. 
Well, he's not the cause of all things that happened. So the Reformed would say, um, everything that you say you want to achieve by middle knowledge, we can do by the, the knowledge of simple intelligence. You know, the knowledge of all possibles. But you want to do more than that. You don't just want to give God the knowledge of all possibles. You actually want to say that God is the kind of God who can create a world where he's not strictly speaking God. So that's an excellent... I mean, I should, have, I should have hit that in the lecture. That's an excellent question. It's the question the students always ask when you teach this. But the Reform would say, if you're, if you're simply not... If you're not really tinkering with the doctrine of God, everything you want should be given to you by the knowledge of simple intelligence. But you're doing something sneaky. You're trying to get something in under the radar at this point. A whole new doctrine of God. When that question's asked, I know that people are understanding. That's a great question. That's, that's the later Owen. I mean, God has a choice. He has the choice of atoning or not atoning. But once God has... So, we can't say that the, the incarnation is absolutely necessary in the way that God is absolutely necessary because God could have decided not to save. But what Owen is saying is that once God has made the decision that he will save the fallen, then he has to send his son incarnate at some point in order to achieve it because he needs a vicarious punitive sacrifice to deal with the problem of sin. He can't waive sacrifice and say, well, I don't need a sacrifice, I'm just going to forgive people by an act of my will. And says, God can't do that. That would be a contradiction of his very being for him to do that. Um, and my... If I was to, to sort of to switch from being a church historian to being more systematic, I think that Owen has some good arguments there. It puts him, so, in some sense, he's almost in the minority in the West up to the point where he writes but I think he's, he's, he's pointing at some real weaknesses of, of reformed previous reformed theology at that point and, and I think if God wishes to forgive sin the necessity of the atonement is is a stronger position to argue for than simply saying God could have done it by an act of his will interestingly enough and the, the, for those interested in, in church history in doing so, he self-consciously and explicitly lines himself up with a group called the Amaraldians, who are, in some sense, a kind of halfway house between the Arminians and the Reformed Orthodox. Uh, and Owen is happy enough to align himself up with them on this issue because he thinks they're correct. And you know, Amaraldianism he regarded as an error. Arminianism he regarded as a heresy, and there is a difference. You can line yourself up with people who are in error on points that they're not in error but you don't want to line yourself up with a heretic at any point, even when you agree with something they might have said. <laughs> there's a famous book, on, there are very few books that go wrong in the title, but there's a very famous book uh, entitled Calvinism and the Amaro Heresy, written in the 1960s. The problem is that the Calvinists on the whole didn't regard Amaro and Amaraldianism as a heresy. They regarded it as an error, but it was not a heresy. And to introduce uh, heresy as a category for analysing it in the very title of your book indicates that you've gone fundamentally wrong before page one. <laughs> so, I think Owen refers to John Cameron as that majestic theologian at some point. And Cameron was an Amar Amaraldian. So, we'll take a break there and uh, grab some coffee and then we'll come back to talk about uh, Christ and the covenants uh, after, after coffee. <laughs>